The Weeping Willow. In the village I grew up in, there are four weeping willow trees standing guard at the banks of River Mukata. I helped plant those. One day, after school, in 1994, I found my grandfather waiting for me so I could help him haul branches of will willows he'd cut from Ian He's farm. He'd already dug the holes. I held each branch as he deposited the soils into the holes. But something bothered me. Roots. They had no roots. It wasn't until the last tree that I summoned the courage to ask. I said, Dada? Hmm? He said, not looking up. But these trees have no roots. <laughs> He laughed. He laughed until it turned into a cough that made him vibrate like a dog, shaking itself free of water. I was used to seeing him like that. It was the tobacco that made him cough. Grandmother hated it. She hated it so much, she faked asthma when he lit his pipe in her presence. He said, now, the willow does not need roots to take form. You'll see next spring. I said, oh, skeptically, careful not to give the impression that I disagree. When I was growing up, you didn't verbalize disagreements with grown-ups. You silenced the questions in your mind. Life would give you the answers in good time. The trees soon withered and lost all life. In December, my mother asked me if I would like to meet my father. I'd never thought about him. I remember one night, Umama was crying as she ironed her clothes, packing them in a suitcase, putting me on her back, and the two of us leaving the house. We walked into the dark of the village. I must have asked, or she must have felt the need to tell me that we were going to my father in Cape Town. I must have fell asleep after that, as I don't remember what happened next. There was no mention of the trip or my father until that December. When Umama asked if I want to meet him, I said yes. I went. My father lived in the slums with houses made of rusty zincs and plastic roofs. He was ugly too. Unlike the handsome man I'd imagined since the idea of a father took form in my mind. But here I was, free to play with other children, unlike in the village where I was responsible for the livestock with little playtime. I lived with him for five years. And never once did I refer to him as my father. Instead, in 1998, when he'd been away, he came back and found that I'd attached a shack of my own to his. My aunt had given me a folding bed and a door. Upra Mike gave me the hammer and nails. My friends and I ripped the hard boards with faces of Tony Leon hanging in lampposts on Lansdowne Road, and those became my walls. That, that was my house. But on the 31st of December, 1999, I went back to the village. If I hadn't, my father and I would have eventually destroyed each other. I arrived in the morning. It had rained the previous day. The soil was wet. The sky was clear. The sun was rising. The goats were trotting up the mountain in single file. Smoke was rising from a neighbor's cooking place. The river was roaring, and there were four giant weeping willows on the banks of River Mkata, their limbs drooping, touching the waters. I was a village boy once more. I finished my schooling and got a place at the University of the Western Cape in Cape Town. The first thing I did was go and see my father. I was a man now, hoping to reconstruct the failed relationship I had with him. When I arrived, I saw that he had converted my house into an additional room. 
I was not pleased. I didn't know what I'd have preferred. At the end of that day, he and I agreed that if we saw each other on the street somewhere, it would be okay to greet, but not much else. I never saw him again. My varsity vacations were spent in the village, and now my uncles, my mother's brothers, were at their worst, letting me know at every opportunity that I didn't belong with them. A year after I finished university, I wrote a book, my first novel, A Man Who Is Not a Man, a provocative, uh, pardon me, a provocative story of abandonment during a circumcision ritual. When I returned home in December 2009, my eldest and most accomplished uncle wrote and hand-delivered letters to my mother and I, asking me to leave his home, his family, for good. As with my book, I had put his family and his culture into disrepute. Nobody said a thing. I left. I never saw any of them again. Since then, I have lived in Durban and now in Cape Town, imagining my home into existence. Home is like a weeping willow, you see. It does not require roots to take form.